You're listening to continuing coverage of the Rust shooting trial against Alec Baldwin from the Hidden Killers podcast and True Crime Today. Now back to the courtroom. We're back on the record. Well, okay, so just clear, you're a witness, okay? So you can say oath or whatever, but are you calling yourself as a witness? Or do you want Mr. Spiro to call you as a witness? It doesn't matter to me. How do you want to do it? I, I don't think it's necessary, frankly, for this evidentiary record for me to call Ms. Morrissey. I know what happened, and the court knows what happened. I, I don't think that we need anything further. Okay, do you want to call yourself as a sure. witness? No, well, just, just a minute. So he's willing, as I understand it, to rest now. Mm -hmm. Okay? Now, you don't have to say anything under oath if you don't want it. No, I'm happy to. Okay, so not only happy to, uh, uh, you know, I don't, I don't, it doesn't matter to me whether you call yourself as a witness. It doesn't matter to the defense whether you call yourself as a witness. So if you're calling yourself as a witness, there's no one here that's requiring you to be called as a witness. The information, everything that happened in this regard, especially as it pertains to me, needs to come out in the public. All right, so you're calling yourself as a witness. And I am. Uh, and it was my understanding that the court indicated to me previously that you wanted me to testify. I understand you've now changed your mind. I think it's a good idea if I do it. Where right. would you like me? Okay. Do you want me here at on the podium? The, no, on the podium. Okay, list. sure. All right, Ms. Morrissey voluntarily calling herself as a witness without any requirement by the court to do so, or Mr. Spiro asking her to. Please raise your right hand. Do you swear or affirm under penalty of law that the testimony you give in this case will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do. All right, go ahead. During my investigation of this case and my review of the evidence in this case, I came to understand that there was a large batch of live ammunition that was in the possession of Thel Reed, Hannah Gutierrez's father. I also understood from all of the evidence and testimony that a portion of that batch of ammunition that belonged to Thel Reed was taken by Thel Reed and Seth Kinney to the 1883 cowboy training camp. When that was over, leftover ammunition was taken back to PDQ props. Seth Kinney took some of the ammunition from that container that he had brought back from Texas and turned it into the sheriff's department. And it appeared to me that he did it to try to exonerate himself. They took it from Mr. Kinney and they tagged it into evidence under the Rust case. Law enforcement then executed a search warrant at PDQ props and they took the entire container. Um, and I I will say that I do agree, as I recall, although I don't, I don't have it in front of me, I do agree that uh, the search warrant didn't really require law enforcement to take everything, but it was my understanding that Mr. Kenny gave them everything so that they would have it and could tag it into evidence. Portions of that ammunition were then sent to the FBI for testing so that they could be compared to the live rounds that were found on the set of rust. The FBI testing demonstrated that the live rounds that were taken from PDQ props that were originally in Texas did not match the live rounds on the set of rust. And that's testimony that we heard during the Gutierrez trial. So what ended up happening was Mr. Bowles, Ms. Gutierrez's lawyer, put Mr. Teske on a witness list and was intending to call him as a witness to the Gutierrez trial. I conducted a pretrial interview of Mr. Teske and I, I wanna back up. I did at this point have some understanding that Mr. Teske had had contact with law enforcement regarding these rounds that he still had in Arizona. So these are rounds that never left Arizona. They were always in the possession of Thel Reed and Troy Teske. They never went to Texas. They never came to New Mexico. That's what all of the evidence indicated. So I understood that Detective Hancock had communication with Mr. Teske about trying to get those rounds and Detective Hancock was unable to get those rounds from Mr. Teske. I did not find that particularly concerning because those rounds had never left Arizona. The filming of Rust 
was in the state of New Mexico. And the rounds that were taken from, from PDQ went from Arizona to Texas to Albuquerque. So ammunition that is in the state of Arizona that has never left Arizona did not strike me that it had significant evidentiary value. Then, oh, oh and I will, tell, I will say, I believe I actually saw a photo of it at that point in time. I was able to look at the ammunition myself and it was visibly dissimilar than the rounds from the set of rust. We then cut to November of 2023. Mr. Bowles has put Mr. Teske on a witness list for the Hannah Gutierrez case. We conducted a pretrial interview with Mr. Teske on November 2nd of 2023. At that point in time, he brought up that he was still in possession of these live rounds that were Thel Reed's live rounds that had never left the state of Arizona. I then, when he started, I think he, I think he indicated during the pretrial interview that they were from the same batch that was sourced from Joe Swanson. And I then said, we should get those from you. I had a conversation with Detective Hancock after that pretrial interview about how we could get the rounds from Mr. Teske. And we were trying to figure out if we could send a local law enforcement agency to pick them up. I was then decided that I needed to figure out if that was necessary since they had never left Arizona. And up to that point, it was my impression that they did not match the live rounds from the set of rust. I then, as I recall, reached out to Mr. Bowles. He and I had a conversation about whether or not the rounds should be tested by the FBI. And I was still trying to figure out if I could get the rounds from Arizona to New Mexico. So I asked Mr. Bowles to please send me a photograph of the rounds from Troy Teske so that I could see with my eyes whether they were even remotely similar. If they were similar, I could go through the steps of obtaining the ammunition, connecting probably with local law enforcement, having a local law enforcement agency go uh, to Mr. Teske's residence and collect them. I didn't want to do that uh, if they didn't look anything like the rounds from the set of rust because all five, all six rounds from the set of rust are identical to each other. So when I had this conversation with Mr. Bowles, he provided me the photograph that I showed this morning. And this is a, it was my understanding that this was a photograph from Troy Teske. So Troy and I don't, uh, communicate. He's a defense witness. I can't communicate with a defense witness. Um, so Mr. Bowles, as I recall, texted me this photo. And this is a photo that Mr. Teske took at my request so that I could determine whether this ammunition was related in any way to the set of rust because it never left the state of Arizona. So if it never left the state of Arizona, the only way that it is relevant to the rust investigation is if it has any similarity to the live rounds that were found on the set of rust, because we were at that point trying to figure out the source of the live rounds. When I received this photograph from Mr. Bowles, I could immediately tell that these are very dissimilar from the live rounds that were found on the set of rust. They have brass primers. So, so this is what was presented to the prosecution as the rounds that were in Mr. Teske's possession. They have brass primers and not silver primers. Um, one of them, the one on the left, appears to be a Starline brass casing but they have truncated cone projectiles. We had seen ammunition that looked exactly like this, not exactly, but, but very, very similar. And that ammunition was the ammunition that was collected from the Sheriff's Department and went to the FBI for testing and was determined not to be similar in any way to the live rounds on the set of rust. So when I saw this photograph, I could see that it was not at all similar to the live rounds on the set of rust. And I decided not to take any steps to collect this ammunition because it was in Arizona, had never come to New Mexico and didn't match the live rounds on the set of rust. So what ends up happening is Mr. Teske is called to New Mexico by Mr. Bowles to testify at the Gutierrez trial. And you can hear on the video that the court heard Mr. Teske say the defense attorney 
that's not me, asked him to bring samples of that ammunition. According to Mr. Teske, he brought the samples of the ammunition, showed them to the defense attorney, and the defense attorney said, I don't want those. I'm not going to use those. And by the way, I'm not going to call you as a witness. So Mr. Teske sat in court during the trial and then at some point contacted the deputies downstairs and said, I have this ammunition. So he tried to give it to the defense attorney, who's the person who asked him to bring it. The defense attorney said no. And he then tried to get a hold of Detective Hancock, who was not available because she was with me. So then he ends up going to the sheriff's department and he leaves the ammunition at the sheriff's department. I was contacted, I don't think it was the same day, but I'm not 100% sure it's possible that it was, by Detective Hancock and she indicated that Troy Teske had dropped off ammunition at the sheriff's department. Because I had already asked for a photograph of it, I believed that that ammunition was going to look like the photograph that Mr. Bowles had sent me. Corporal Hancock indicated that she was going to tag them into evidence and she was going to create what she called a doc report. And I said, great, do that. I was not aware at that point in time that a doc report would not have the same case number as Rust. I was not aware at that point in time that it would not be linked to the Rust case number. I understood that he had dropped off ammunition that I believed to not look similar to the ammunition from the set of Rust and I had no idea that it wasn't going to have the same case number. I want to show the court though when Mr. Teske showed up to testify with the, live, with the ammunition that Mr. Bowles told him to bring to the state of New Mexico. He was not called as a witness, and Mr. Bowles said, I'm not taking that ammunition from you. That's why. Because these are photographs from Hannah Gutierrez's cell phone extraction, and they show spot-on match for the live rounds found on the set of Rust. This is clearly the reason that Mr. Bowles said, you and your ammunition better get out of here because it would not have hurt the case, the state's case against Hannah Gutierrez. It would have been the best evidence I could have hoped for. These are, these look exactly like the ammunition, the actual ammunition that we have in evidence, and they do look like the three rounds that are in that envelope. So when Mr. Teske couldn't get Mr. Bowles to take them because they were the best evidence against his client, he took them over to the Sheriff's Department. And when he dropped them at the Sheriff's Department, I was told that there was going to be a report. There was a report. I assume they look like these. And Detective Hancock indicated to me that because he dropped them off and he didn't wait for her, she was then going to try to follow up with him, take a statement from him, so that we could get some idea where they came from, what the relevance was, if there was any relevance at all. And he never returned her phone calls. And that's all of the information that I can give the court, but I'm happy to answer any questions. May I ask a few questions, Your Honor? <laughs> when you took over this case, um, the investigator handling the case, Mr. Schilling, left the case, correct? At my request, yes. The paralegal that was handling this case with you left the case, Mr. Tad. At my request, yes. Well, the first prosecutor that was working with you on this case, you selected, correct? I did. And he resigned, too? I wouldn't say that he resigned, no. Okay. He didn't stay on the case for the Alec Baldwin trial, correct? No, and he indicated that that was because he represented a labor union that's a national labor union, and he was not expecting the trial to be set so quickly. He wasn't expecting it to be set in July. So when he realized that the trial was going to be set in July, he was going to be in collective bargaining agreements for his national labor union, and he wasn't going to be able to have enough time. Or Linda Johnson, the next prosecutor selected, resigned from the case today? She did. Based in part on the conduct we're here discussing, correct? Uh, I believe that Ms. Johnson uh, uh, has, Ms. Johnson didn't want their, my understanding is, is that she didn't agree with the decision to have a public hearing. On July 1st in this matter, you served a certificate of compliance with 5501, correct? I did. 
And um, you've never turned over the report or any of the evidence that we're talking about here at this hearing, correct? Uh, let's take it one at a time. Um, I did not turn over the report. I didn't have a copy of the report. Um, the rounds that were left at the Sheriff's Department by Troy Teske, I have absolutely no reason to believe that they are relevant to the incident that took place on the set of Rust. These are rounds that were in the possession of Thel Reed and never left the state of Arizona. Um, you also did not um, allow the defense to view that evidence at any point during our request to review evidence in this case? I had never seen it and I didn't realize that it wasn't under the same case number because I'm not a law enforcement officer and I don't work at the Sheriff's Department, but uh, you are right. And, and you concede that they are Starline Brass Silver 45, right? I can. Uh, and, and this is the best evidence against Hannah Gutierrez. Yeah, you've said that a couple of times. Um, any favorable evidence you understand as a prosecutor has to be turned over to the defense, correct? I do. Any evidence that could be used as a defense to potentially be favorable has to be turned over to the defense. Absolutely. Right? So the third Hague report that never got turned over to the defense, you understand that that's Brady evidence? I did, yes. Okay. And you also failed to turn that over in this case as well, correct? It, what, it, and let me, let, let me give you a full answer to your question. When the second Hague report came in, and I provided all of this to the defense, I sent it to the person who is managing the discovery server and asked them to upload it. It wasn't until I realized during pretrial interviews that it wasn't there, that there was a problem with it. So I then attempted to figure out what the problem was, and it was indicated to me that it appeared that the former paralegal who was working for the special prosecutor had removed it. So we then immediately provided it. Then during the pretrial interview of Mr. Haig, it was brought to my attention that the defense did not have the August 31st report that indicated that the gun functioned fine, perfectly fine, and that was provided immediately. I went back, I checked my email, I could see that I received it from Mr. Haig and failed to forward it on to be uploaded, and I provided it as soon as I was aware that you did not have it. Um, the, the fact that nobody at the Hannah Gutierrez retrial um, cross-examine Mr. Haig about the report didn't clue you into the fact that nobody had the report? Um, actually, it didn't, and I'd like to address that. The reason that it didn't clue me in is because Hannah Gutierrez's defense was that the gun worked perfectly. Uh, the, the defense in Hannah Gutierrez was never interested in any evidence that there was an issue with the gun, because if there was an issue with the gun, it damaged her case. So what you could see, if you watched the trial or saw any of the transcripts, the defense actually brought in their own expert to say that the gun worked perfectly. So they had no interest in that information. And, and actually you elicited testimony from Mr. Haig um, at that trial that was inconsistent, at least partially inconsistent as the court's aware, with his third report, correct? Tell, tell me what you're referring to and I'll answer your question. Well, there was a whole hearing about this where you saw this and you saw me go back and forth with Mr. Haig for 25 minutes, so I don't... I agree, but I need to know what you're talking about for me to answer your question. Okay, if you can't answer the question, you can't answer the question, I'll move on. I'm happy to, but... The, 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 you say that the, the extent of the communications you have about the doc report um, as you, you relay it to the court is that all you said in response was, great, do that, that's your testimony? Yeah, I, I, I assumed that it was going to be tied to the same case number. So I said, great, do it, file a report. No follow-up question? No, um, because I had a picture of the ammunition that didn't match the ammunition from the set of rust. No concerns in your mind when you got the case file and you turned it over to us and it wasn't included? Absolutely not. There's a, there, there's a terabyte of discovery. I didn't know whether this two-page police report had been provided. And in addition to that, I had no reason to believe and still have no reason to believe that those rounds have anything to do with these cases. As I asked you about Mr. Haig, um, yesterday when Ms. Popple testified, you would agree with me that her testimony under oath was false. What part of her testimony was false? And I'll answer. That she said that these rounds don't look anything like the rounds on the set when you elicited that testimony. I agree with you. And I didn't realize that there were rounds that looked like that. It's okay. In any event, um, when the court, um, and you never tested those rounds either, correct? Any of the rounds that came from Mr. Teske? No, because they came in just a few months ago. And the court asked you actually one question that I want to address, which is the court said to you, well, what's interesting to me, to be quite honest, is that yesterday you didn't even want to do a written reply. You wanted to just give an oral response. And, and what you said to the court was, 
I never saw these, I've never seen these, and I never saw the report. I have absolutely never seen these until this morning. Do you remember saying that to the court? With regard to the three Starline brass, um, the, with regard to the three cartridges that appear to be similar to rust, yes. Well, I have never, I'd never saw them until today. Well, but you said also, I never saw the report, right? I never did. Right, but don't you think, given your duty of candor to this court, that that's awfully misleading to not tell the court at that point that you knew about this when it occurred long ago? That I knew about what? You knew that Mr. Teske had turned in this evidence, that you knew that the report would have existed because you just told this court that the doc report was okayed by you. Sure. Um, don't you think it was misleading to this court to not just say at that point, you know, just so you know, I know about this. I knew about this then. I was involved. I did not intend to mislead the court. My understanding of what was dropped off at the sheriff's department is on this computer screen and it looks absolutely nothing like the live rounds from the set of rust. Um, the truth of this matter is um, you don't like Mr. Baldwin very much, do you? You know, that is absolutely untrue. I actually really appreciate Mr. Baldwin's movies. I really appreciated uh, the acting that he did on Saturday Night Live, and I really appreciate his politics. Um, you told one of the witnesses who disagreed with you during an interview that you thought Mr. Baldwin was a cocksucker. I do not recall saying that. I know that that was something that Mr. Baldwin would say on the set of Rust. I don't recall saying that. Do you deny that under oath? Without having more information, I can tell you that I do not recall ever saying that. And if I did say it, I invite you to point it out to me. You called him an arrogant prick to another witness. To who? To what witness? I'm asking you, did you call him an arrogant prick during a witness interview? I don't believe I did. I don't recall. Do you deny that? Without knowing what you're talking about? I, I, all I can tell you is that I can't respond if I don't know what you're talking about. And you, you said also to witnesses that you would teach him a lesson. I never said to witnesses that I would teach him a lesson. Absolutely not. In fact, Mr. Spiro, I want to give a full response to your question. I made every effort in this case to resolve this case with your client in a very favorable way for him. All right, I'm going to move to strike this. It's not responsive. It, it is well, responsive. I don't want to talk about plea negotiation. Yeah, and it's not, and it's not responsive. So I, I have no further questions. All right, do you have any follow-up testimony? All right. I, I, I want to say I have no recollection of, of calling him any of those names. I have invited the defendant to tell me what he's talking about, and he has declined. I want the court to take notice of that. Thank you. You may step down. All right, any other witnesses? No, Your Honor. All right, um, argument, let's not, um, 15 minutes aside sufficient? I don't even think that that is necess necessary, frankly. Do you want to make argument? Further argument. Yep. All right. I don't think either side needs further argument on this time. All right. So dismissal with prejudice is a very extreme sanction. And uh, case law is very clear that uh, because it's uh, very extreme, I have to go through every single element and I have to make a very good record as to what, why I'm, I'm seeing what I'm seeing. So in order to establish a Brady violation, the defendant must show that the prosecution suppressed evidence the evidence was favorable to the accused, and the evidence was material to the defense. So let's go through the elements. Suppression of evidence. The definition of suppression of elements, this is Case versus Hatch, is while the first element requires proof that the prosecution suppressed or withheld the evidence in question, it does not require a finding of bad faith or any other culpable state of mind on the part of the prosecutor. This prong is satisfied. The Santa Fe County Sheriff's Office and the prosecution failed to disclose the supplemental report to defense and provide defense an opportunity to inspect the rounds collected into evidence that Mr. Teske gave. Is the evidence favorable to the accused? The second Brady element is whether the suppressed evidence was favorable to the accused, either as impeachment or exculpatory evidence. This prong is satisfied. The suppressed evidence is favorable to the accused. It is impeachment evidence, has even been offered in this trial as impeachment evidence, and is potentially exculpatory to the defense. Critically, the exculpatory value cannot be analyzed at such a late juncture because of the non-disclosure. Is the evidence material? While post-trial discovery of evidence under Brady requires a reasonable probability that the result of the proceeding would have been different, discovery of evidence during trial 
requires an evaluation of whether the late tender has impeded the effective use of evidence in such a way that it impacts the fundamental fairness of the proceedings, and that is uh, State versus Huerta Cost Castro. This evidence is material. The late discovery of this evidence during trial has impeded the effective use of evidence in such a way that it has impacted the fundamental fairness of the proceedings. The defense is not in a position to test the state's theory as to the source of the live rounds that killed Ms. Hutchins. I'm also going to take a look at Harper, State versus Harper. The assessment of sanctions depends upon the extent of the government's culpability weighed against the amount of prejudice to the state, quoting Chouinard. Let's go through culpability. Our case law generally provides that the refusal to comply with a district court's discovery order only rises to the level of exclusion or dismissal where the state's conduct is especially culpable, such as where evidence is unilaterally withheld by the state in bad faith or all access to the evidence is precluded by state intransience. The state is highly culpable for its failure to provide this discovery to the defendant. The state unilaterally withheld a supplemental report. Santa Fe County Sheriff's Officer made the decision, and apparently also with the, with the prosecutor, as pursuant to Hancock's testimony, that the evidence was of no evidentiary value and failed to connect the evidence to the instant case. The case agent, as well as pursuant to Hancock's testimony, Ms. Morrissey, was aware of the new evidence and yet did not make an effort to disclose it to defense. The state's willful withholding of this information was intentional and deliberate. If this conduct does not rise to the level of bad faith, it certainly comes so near to bad faith as to show signs of scorching. Prejudice. When discovery has been produced late, prejudice does not accrue unless the evidence is material and the disclosure is so late that it undermines the definition the defendant's preparation for trial. The court concludes that this conduct is highly prejudicial to the defendant. The jury has been sworn, jeopardy has attached, and this disclosure during the course of trial is so late that it undermines the defendant's preparation for trial. There is no way for the court to right this wrong. Lesser sanctions under Harper. Trial courts possess broad discretionary authority to decide what sanction to impose when a discovery order is violated, State versus Lemire. The sanction of dismissal is the only warranted remedy. The jury has been sworn, jeopardy has attached, and a mistrial would not be based upon manifest necessity. Further, the sanction of dismissal is warranted in this case. The state has repeatedly made representations to defense and to the court that they were compliant with all their discovery obligations. Despite their repeated representations, they have continued to fail to disclose critical evidence to the defense. Brady and Harper are satisfied. Dismissal with prejudice is warranted. Court also has power, inherent power. Per State v. Lemire, where discovery violations inject needless delay into the proceedings, courts may impose meaningful sanctions to effectuate their inherent power and promote efficient judicial administration. The state's discovery violation has injected a needless, incurable delay into the instant jury trial. Dismissal with prejudice is warranted to ensure the integrity of the judicial system and the efficient administration of justice. Your motion to dismiss with prejudice is granted. Now, with respect to the jury, I don't imagine you all want to return on Monday. I will take care of the jury. Thank you, Ron. We are in recess. I'm not getting up. I'm, I'm going to finish. Just dismiss him, Judge. Dismiss him. Go ahead. Thank you all for your help. Stay well, okay?
There's more to come in the Rust shooting trial against Alec Baldwin from the Hidden Killers podcast and True Crime Today. Press subscribe now.